I'm really sorry that uh, Hurricane Sandy has uh, stood in the way or prevented me from flying out to be with you tonight because uh, this event for, for me is a real homecoming. 46 years ago in uh, 1966, as was mentioned, I began my professional career uh, at the University of, of Michigan. And what I'd like to do uh, today, uh, this evening, is to talk to you uh, first a bit about the role that the University of Michigan and the Center for Chinese Studies have played in the evolution of our relations with China. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about uh, how Chinese uh, relations uh, with the United States improved over uh, the period of several administrations. And then uh, finally, we'll talk about some of the challenges today that we face in uh, managing the U.S.-China relationship. I suspect uh, not too many of you uh, in the room uh, tonight will uh, recognize many of the names, but I would like to mention those who really had built China, uh, the University of Michigan and its China Center into a major national resource. Under the leadership of uh, Professor Alexander Eckstein, uh, a world famous economist, uh, the U of M uh, in the 1960s uh, was built into one of the major national centers for work on China. And I can uh, think of at least 10 of my colleagues uh, who, when I showed up at Michigan in 1966, uh, were part of this remarkable collection of, uh, uh, of talent. Uh, there was Professor uh, Albert Wo uh, Feuerwerker in the history department, uh, Professor Bob Dernberger, an economist, uh, Alan Whiting, had recently left the government and he joined uh, the Michigan Center to work on uh, international relations. Rhodes Murphy, a geographer, uh, Charles Hucker, uh, an historian of China, Martin White, a sociologist, uh, Don Monroe, uh, whose uh, wife I was delighted to see in the audience earlier tonight, uh, Don in the uh, Department of Philosophy and Norma Diamond and Anthropology. So this was really uh, an institution, a university, with a remarkable uh, range of talent for dealing uh, with China. And I should also note that out of the Michigan program were to come a number of people who played a major role in subsequent years in managing uh, the U.S.-China relationship, and I'm thinking of Professor Michael Oxenberg, uh, who was in the, uh, the Carter administration, and uh, Professor Ken Lieberthal, uh, who was in the Clinton administration. And uh, so Michigan has made a major contribution over the years in the study and the practice of managing relations with China. I have to note that when I first came to uh, uh, Ann Arbor in 1966, the campus was in turmoil. Uh, the Vietnam War was raging, and everyone was frankly very fearful that uh, the United States would get pulled into another war with China, as of course we had happened in the case of uh, Korea in 1950. So there was great concern about China in that context. And I remember very clearly my first class. I had never had any experience teaching, but I was assigned a classroom in, uh, in Haven Hall. And uh, I had just finished my dissertation and I walked down a long corridor in Haven Hall towards the classroom I was assigned to. I was gonna teach a course about the Chinese revolution. And as I approached the classroom, I could hear a buzz getting louder and louder. And when I entered the classroom, I was shocked to see over 170 students. The classroom held about 50 students. And why was that classroom overflowing with students? It wasn't because they knew anything about me. I was just beginning my career. I had no professional reputation at that point. 
they were concerned, many of those students, either about their, their concerns about China or many of them, I think, were looking to Chairman Mao to understand how he made a revolution. Uh, today, the campus is pretty quiet, but uh, in those days, there was an element uh, in the, certainly in the student body that uh, was very revolutionary minded. And so they came to my class thinking I was going to teach them about how to make revolution. Well, I'm a fairly conservative person, so it really wasn't that kind of a class, but it was, it was very, very interesting. This was also the time when under Professor Eckstein's initiative, along with uh, China scholars uh, at many universities, Doak Barnett at uh, Columbia, Lucian Pai at uh, MIT and others, uh, out of concern for the possible confrontation with China, an institution, a uh, very important one was established, the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, which as was mentioned, is co-sponsoring uh, today's uh, event. Now, one of the more interesting things, apart from Professor Eckstein's leadership, was that my first graduate student, who was there in Lane Hall, when I showed up, the, the China Center was in Lane Hall. And uh, my first graduate student was a young lady named Jan Barris. And Jan Barris, who unfortunately can't be with us tonight uh, because of a family commitment, uh, Jan has played a major role for 40 years in uh, leading the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, which has responsibility for, for cultural exchanges. So this was Solomon in 1971 when he was starting his career uh, teaching at the University of Michigan. Now, during the five years I was on the faculty, uh, things came to a very interesting uh, development in 1971. That was the year of what we now call ping pong diplomacy. And uh, in April of 1971, Premier Zhou Enlai invited the American ping pong team uh, to come to China as a signal of the interest in uh, trying to improve relations. And one of my more interesting experiences was playing ping pong. This is a picture that was taken the next year. Uh, I'm playing ping pong there with the world, world's number one ping pong player, Zhuang Zedong. Uh, we had gone to China with Henry Kissinger to uh, build on uh, the Nixon initiative. And uh, so ping pong ironically became one of the more important signals that China was sending to the United States about its interest in improving relations. Now, in the summer of 1971, I was, I had been invited to join Kissinger's staff on the National Security Council for a year uh, to uh, work on China issues. So in the summer of 1971, I was teaching a course uh, to make up my uh, teaching responsibilities and on July 15th of 1971, uh, one of my colleagues said, oh, President Nixon's going to give a speech tonight. And I said, well, I'm really not interested in hearing it. I'm sure it's going to be about Vietnam. But we watched uh, the speech anyway. And to everyone's shock and surprise, President Nixon announced that he had already sent Henry Kissinger secretly to China to begin the process of normalizing relations uh, between the two countries. And so unexpectedly, I had the good fortune of suddenly being caught up in some of the most interesting diplomacy of, uh, frankly, of the 20th century. I'll talk a little more about it. I had spent 10 years studying, learning about China. Uh, I had particularly focused on the leadership style of Mao Zedong of Chairman Mao. And one of the interesting things that developed uh, during my period of government work uh, was an opportunity to meet uh, with, with Chairman Mao. This was a picture taken uh, during the visit of, of President Ford. Uh, and Chairman Mao there is not in very good health. 
the picture was taken about uh, six months before he died. Uh, but uh, again, I was very fortunate to have been able to not only study what was going on in China, but actually to uh, meet many of the leaders, uh, Premier Zhou Enlai, Chairman Mao, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who we'll talk about in a minute. So my career was uh, blessed with some very interesting, both scholarly and practical activities. Uh, how does our relationship with China look 40 years after uh, the initiative to open relations between uh, President Nixon and Chairman Mao. Uh, let me begin just with my bottom line with uh, the key point uh, that today managing the U.S.-China relationship is one of the great strategic challenges of American foreign policy and indeed of China's foreign policy. But at the time, what today looks like uh, a very uh, difficult challenge uh, was an event that really transformed the Cold War to the benefit of both the United States and China. That the Nixon opening and what followed, and particularly in Deng Xiaoping's policy of opening China to the world, laid the basis for the truly unprecedented uh, economic takeoff that uh, we're all well aware of today that has made China the number two economy uh, in the world. Now, let me say a few things about uh, uh, the Nixon initiative to uh, open relations with China uh, and what it led to over subsequent years. President Nixon was one of the most strategically minded uh, leaders that uh, our country has, has had. Uh, he was a veteran of the Second World War. And as you may remember, he was President Eisenhower's vice president. And uh, in that role as vice president, he traveled all around the world, uh, developing uh, relations between the United States and other countries who were concerned about the threat from the Soviet Union. Now, the strategic challenge that the United States faced in the Cold War was how to deal with a two-front challenge. How did we deal with a China that had allied itself in 19, late 49 or 1950 with the Soviet Union, creating for the United States a challenge on two fronts? Uh, in, in Europe, of course, uh, we confronted the Soviet military buildup. Then there was the war in Korea, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then the Vietnam War. So the United States was sort of spread eagle between challenges uh, on, both, on both frontiers. The Vietnam War was in some ways uh, the most rending conflict of that period. Uh, and uh, because of the fears of being drawn into that war, the fears of many young people in the universities who didn't want to go to fight and potentially die in the jungles of Vietnam. Uh, there was enormous public opposition to the Vietnam War. Indeed, the war had destroyed the presidency of Lyndon Johnson. And you'll remember in 1968, President Johnson said that he would not run for a second term because he had lost political support. Well, President, Mr. Nixon in the mid-1960s was thinking about running for the presidency, and he certainly didn't want his prospects for a good presidency to be destroyed by the Vietnam War. So that he began thinking about how do I av avoid getting trapped in the Vietnam conflict? And in 1967, he wrote an article called Asia After Vietnam, where he hinted at his uh, possible effort to improve relations with China. And this was a great strategic maneuver, a way of leapfrogging out of the Vietnam quagmire uh, to deal with what Nixon saw as the primary security challenge to the United States, which was the Soviet Union. Nixon calculated that China could be split or separated from the Soviet Union. 
And there have been early signs of real tension between Moscow and Beijing starting around 1960. Uh, Chairman Mao and Nikita Khrushchev, uh, the Soviet leader, really hated, hated, hated one another. And uh, so tensions through the early 60s began to significantly increase. And then in 1968, the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. And the leader at that time was Leonid Brezhnev. And he proclaimed a policy of limited sovereignty for socialist states, which was a way of saying that the Soviet Union reserved the right to intervene in the affairs of other socialist or communist countries uh, if it was threatening the, the integrity, the unity of the socialist bloc. And at the same time, the Russians were building up their military forces uh, on China's northern, northern border. So the situation was evolving in a way that Nixon said, well, maybe we can make common cause with the Chinese. But of course, many people, and certainly those of us who were studying China at the time, didn't think this was possible. China was in the middle of its cultural revolution, this great internal political upheaval uh, that uh, Chairman Mao had launched in 1965 to deal with uh, his opposition uh, in the leadership. And so there was one point of view in the many circles, certainly in the government, that the United States should not get involved in this growing dispute between the Soviet Union and China. There's an old Chinese phrase about, uh, that actually comes from Sun Tzu, to uh, sit on the mountaintop and let the tigers fight. It's a way of saying to, uh, if you have opposition, let them fight it out, don't get caught in the middle of it. But Nixon had a different view. He calculated that because of the threat from the Soviet Union, a threat that was sh shared with China, uh, that the two countries could join together uh, and uh, in that way protect themselves uh, against pressures from the Soviet Union. And so when, on that July 15th, 1971 uh, date, when, when Nixon announced that he was uh, going to go to China and try to normalize relations, there was both a tremendous sense of shock. People couldn't believe that given all the tensions with China that, that Nixon could, uh, would be welcome in China. But there was also a great sense of relief uh, that with the uh, uh, effort to improve relations with uh, China, that we could avoid being pulled into a war uh, over the Vietnam uh, conflict. And so this initiative of President Nixon and Chairman Mao Zedong changed the dynamic of the Cold War in a fundamental way. It put the Soviet Union on the defensive, and uh, it gave President Nixon the ability to uh, create the context by which he could disengage the United States uh, from the Vietnam conflict. Nixon visited China in February of uh, 1972 and gave authoritative uh, support to the effort to normalize uh, Sino-American relations. But the relationship really went through uh, two phases in its positive uh, development. Uh, first, the, the Nixon period and his meeting with Mao gave authoritative blessing to the initiative. But there was a lot of opposition within China to improving relations with the United States. After all, during the Cultural Revolution, the United States, American imperialism, we were attacked uh, vigorously. So suddenly to have this flip in policy uh, was disconcerting to many people in China, not to mention in the United States. And so while the situation improved a bit under Nixon and Mao, uh, you'll remember that uh, President Nixon had to resign his uh, presidency in 1974 because of the Watergate scandal. And following his resignation, and then the death of Chairman Mao uh, two years later, the relationship really didn't move 
uh, in a in a very positive direction. Uh, at that time, uh, I was involved in efforts to uh, negotiate more cultural exchanges, more trade, but the Chinese leadership, particularly under the influence of the so-called Gang of Four, Chairman Mao's wife, Zhang Qing, and, and other leaders, and other more revolutionary-minded people in the Chinese leadership, the, the relationship didn't go very, uh, very far. But that changed at the end of the decade. In 1979, uh, three years after Chairman Mao died, Deng Xiaoping established his leadership position and initiated a policy of opening China to the world. And so suddenly, again, overnight in a, in a shock, uh, Deng Xiaoping said he wanted to send hundreds of students from uh, China to study in the United States. And just today, uh, I had this kind of a uh, 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 electronic uh, seminar with a number of students from China studying here at the, the University of Michigan. And uh, four of them were Chinese nationals who had uh, studied in China and had come to Michigan to uh, broaden their understanding of the United States and uh, to learn more about uh, uh, U.S.-China relations. So beginning with Deng Xiaoping in 1979, the relationship entered with what is now considered a kind of golden age of U.S.-China relations through the 1980s. Uh, During the 1980s, uh, China's economy began to take off. Uh, the political mood uh, that had uh, been characteristic of Chinese politics under Chairman Mao it virtually evaporated. Chairman Mao talked about politics in command. Deng Xiaoping really made economic development the commanding uh, issue uh, in China's normalization. And so all during the 1980s, the atmosphere in China opened up and uh, the economy really took off. But then tragically, in 1989, there was a development that in many ways had been sparked by the Deng Xiaoping opening. In, uh, in that year, 1989, in the spring, there was uh, a movement from young people to promote democracy in China. And there was a so-called democracy wall movement where students were posting uh, post, uh, big character posters calling for democracy. And by June of that year, uh, students all over the country were, were basically calling for an end to the one-party dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. Now, all of that came to a head in an event we all know about uh, when the students assembled in Tiananmen Square demonstrating again for political reform. The leadership of the Communist Party split. There was a, a more moderate element headed by the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, Zhao Ziyang, that wanted to liberalize politics. But under Deng Xiaoping, there was a conservative element that said no, that that would challenge the stability of the country. And as you well know, uh, the student movement was crushed with the use of uh, military force. And so the Tiananmen incident really dramatically changed in a negative way the whole atmosphere of U.S.-China uh, relations. There was a very strong negative reaction, not just in the United States, but around the world. Economic sanctions were imposed on China, and in other ways, the country was uh, subject to... Uh, uh, counter pressure and, and criticism uh, in many parts of the world. So that U.S. China relations starting in 1989 entered a, a real chill period. Despite that situation, China's economy continued to grow. And again, for what has been over three decades, uh, China has grown at 10 percent a year and, of course, today is now the second largest economy in the world. What is the outcome of, of this history and of uh, China's economic takeoff? 
millions of peasants, people largely out of the countryside, have been lifted out of poverty. Uh, but along with that economic growth have, have come some negatives. Uh, there are great regional disparities within China. The eastern provinces along the coast that manufacture for export have seen their, their, uh, their wealth increase, while inland provinces have not grown uh, nearly so uh, quickly. Uh, local officials have uh, been engaging in corrupt uh, practices, acquiring land from uh, peasants where they want to build factories, attracting foreign investment, uh, but at the cost of uh, leaving the local people feeling very uh, misused. And by official announcement, there are uh, over 100,000 demonstrations every year, something about that order of magnitude of local people protesting against uh, official corruption. And young people today uh, are very concerned about the growing gap between the, the leadership, the elite, and the mass public, uh, growing disparities in, in income. So that along with this dramatic economic growth have come political tensions, which have created a kind of gap between the one-party system that brought the Chinese Communist Party to power and the tremendous economic growth and the social mobilization of the country. And part of that uh, tension is generated by the fact that today China is a wired society. Everybody has cell phones, everybody gets on the internet so that people in China know what's going on and they can communicate uh, with each other. And, and uh, from discussions I've had with uh, senior Chinese uh, officials or uh, leaders in uh, various think tanks. The Chinese Communist Party today feels under very substantial political pressure uh, because the society, the people, have been mobilized by the information uh, revolution. So today, Chinese society has become dependent on continuing economic growth, uh, which is tied to uh, its export-led growth model, that is, uh, producing for uh, exports, which generates income for the country, but a pattern in which uh, people are not uh, benefiting by seeing their standards of living rise as much as the elite is now profiting from this economic takeoff. And so today, as China approaches the transition to its fifth generation leadership, uh, the Chinese Communist Party leaders are again facing some fundamental problems about how to deal with the issue of political reform and whether they should shift to a very different develop, economic development strategy. That is, moving away from export-led growth to one that now will uh, stress uh, the expansion of consumer uh, industries and, and give more attention to the growth of uh, of income benefits uh, to the Chinese, uh, Chinese people. So today, uh, one can say we're at a break point or a fundamental point of change, not only in U.S.-China relations, uh, but in China's role in the world and indeed in international politics. The Cold War is over, and we've had four decades of normal if times tense relations between uh, the United States and China. Today, we face a very different international agenda than we did when I began my teaching career at Michigan. Then the issue was how we deal with the Soviet Union, the Soviet threat, a Soviet Union that had allied itself with, uh, with China, uh, and an, a world in which security threats were the main problem uh, we didn't think very much about economic growth. Today, the issue of economic stability in, in a situation where the global economy has expanded dramatically with the collapse of the Soviet Union is creating uh, both tremendous opportunities but also uh, real tensions. 
Today, we worry about uh, issues that were not on the national or international agenda a decade or, or two ago. Energy security. If China is to continue to grow its economy, it needs to have secure sources of energy. And uh, lots of other countries that are growing rapidly, India and advanced uh, or more developed countries, whether it's Japan or the United States, we're all worried about energy security. Nuclear proliferation. During the Cold War, the United States and uh, the Soviet Union kept pretty tight control over their, their nuclear technologies. But as we know today, in the case of North Korea, Pakistan, Iran, uh, nuclear technologies are getting out of control and creating the real risk of uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Terrorism, something we didn't even think about back during the Cold War, major source of uh, security for us all. During the Cold War, we worried about big nation states who had threatened our security and global stability in the, in the 20th century, whether it was Germany, Japan, the Soviet Union. Today, ironically, our main concern is with weak or failing states that are taken over by these uh, terrorist groups. Now, if you analyze all of these contemporary problems, uh, China has some role to play in virtually all of them, and they are issues that, that we discuss uh, year by year, day by day, in official dealings between China and the United States. So where is the Sino-American relationship today? Where are U.S.-China relations? I think the best way to put it is that we are neither allies nor adversaries. Uh, there are areas where we cooperate, where we benefit from our normal relations, but there are also significant areas where our interests collide. Uh, and as uh, Professor Kenneth Lieberthal, again, one of Michigan's uh, 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 former uh, uh, professors at the, uh, in the political science department and at the China Center uh, has done uh, in a study that he published recently with Professor Wang Jisu from uh, Peking University, there's just a high level of growing mistrust between the two countries. Today, China and the United States are locked into a mutual interdependence. China fears uh, the loss of our markets. It fears the loss of investment. Uh, it is concerned about the pressure that uh, some of our officials put on China to be politically transparent, to uh, put more emphasis on human rights, uh, pressures that are viewed by the Chinese communist leadership as politically destabilizing. For, for the part of the United States, there is growing concern about our growing economic dependence on China. Uh, the fact that China holds a very large proportion of our national debt. There's concern that uh, with jobs in the manufacturing center uh, sector migrating to China, that the U.S. economy is being hollowed out, at least as far as its manufacturing base is concerned. Uh, there's concern about China's anti-competitive economic practices uh, uh, a theft of intellectual property, uh, restriction of market access or dumping of some products uh, in violation of uh, the rules of the World Trade uh, Organization, and a reluctance of China to cooperate with the United States on a number of uh, important issues, whether it's Iran, North Korea, uh, or today on, on Syria. So. Today, the U.S.-China relationship is uh, filled with a lot of tension, and you could say it's drifting again towards an aspect of uh, confrontation. Within China, the country, having grown so dramatically in the last uh, four decades, is feeling its, uh, its oats, its, uh, its power, and it wants to see its position in the world strengthened. 
And so just in the last few years, there's been real pressure that uh, China, particularly through its growing military, uh, have, has put forward for uh, territorial claims in the East and the South China Seas that has raised tremendous tension with countries like Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, uh, countries with whom the United States either has alliances in the case of Japan or uh, the Philippines, or has friendly relations. And so the United States is now in a position where it wants to support our allies, uh, but at the same time, it wants to uh, maintain cooperative relations with, with China. Uh, this, this creates this uh, pattern of uh, neither allies nor adversaries where the United States and China today uh, are struggling to find some way of managing their relationship uh, to the benefit of both countries. Uh, this is occurring where the United States under the Obama administration is sending more troops to uh, the, the Western Pacific to support our allies. This is the so-called policy of pivoting or rebalancing our presence uh, in East Asia. So there are big question marks about where the U.S.-China relationship uh, is headed. When we look back in history, the Nixon opening back in 1972 uh, changed the character of the Cold War very much to America's benefit and to the benefit of uh, China. For the United States, it ended our two-front confrontation and laid the basis for normalizing relations with China, and it created the circumstance where under Deng Xiaoping, the country uh, started its dramatic economic uh, uh, takeoff. So in conclusion, uh, one can say that the, the Nixon initiative and the four decades of uh, normalized relations, despite their current tensions, have been of great benefit to both, uh, both countries. Yet we're finding today that uh, China, as it, uh, its strength grows, is not an easy partner. China has never had uh, good alliance relationships with countries of similar size. Certainly that was its experience in the alliance with the Soviet Union that uh, was established in 1950. So even though we are drifting in some ways back towards confrontation, we still have fundamental areas of common interest. And the challenge of managing U.S.-China relations today is building on those areas of common interest, of trying to make clear to uh, China that the United States is a stabilizing force in East Asia and that we will support the interests of our, of our allies in the region. And what can be hoped for is the evolution of a what you might call a strategic equilibrium in East Asia. That is where the U.S. and China learn, learn to work together and their respective presence and activities in the region kind of balance, balance each other off. So that is the great challenge today of managing U.S.-China relations. Now, I appreciate your your attention, you're coming out on a uh, on an evening. I don't know whether it's raining in uh, Ann Arbor, but it certainly is here in Washington. And uh, for me, again, the uh, the chance to engage with uh, uh, the Michigan China Center and and others of you interested in U.S.-China relations, uh, I very much appreciate this opportunity. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions in our remaining time, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, 
he, first of all, thank him for his lecture. Um, the question is this. Um, if China and the United States in the next, say, 20 years go from being not adversaries, not mere acquaintances, but actual allies, uh, and China becomes stronger and stronger economically like it is, would there be uh, a possibility of the United States working with mainland China to solve the problems that exist between Taiwan and China? In other words, if China were to become democratic in 20 years as it prospers and more freedoms are allowed by the Communist Party, would that um, all of a sudden, with, say, U.S. cooperation and whatnot, cause Taiwan to want to, uh, at that point, become part of China again? That's a very... You need me to repeat the question? Did you... Uh, Richard, did you hear the question? Oh, it's a very, very good... It's a very... hear some other noise, but... Um, let's say that uh, the, the Taiwan issue is uh, a very interesting one in the history of uh, uh, this relationship. When it was, of course, a major uh, point of concern in 1972 uh, when Nixon first went to China. And the understanding that he developed with Chairman Mao was that Taiwan was not the central issue as long as there was an understanding that eventually uh, Taiwan and the mainland would, would come to some reunification. But Chairman Mao said to Nixon that he could wait 100 years for that reunification to occur. So Chairman Mao put uh, China's security and its problems with the Soviet Union in, in first rank, and the Taiwan issue was put uh, somewhat... Uh, down the list of, of priorities. What has happened since that time? The Taiwan, the situation across the strait used to be a matter of the Civil War. You all know, of course, that Chiang Kai-shek in 1949 had fled to Taiwan, and until he died in 1975, there was still an atmosphere of civil war between the island and the mainland. But that circumstance has largely disappeared. Today, relations between uh, uh, Taiwan and the mainland, between Beijing and, and Taipei, have dramatically improved. There's not only a great deal of economic inter interplay between the island and the mainland, uh, but there's also political dialogue. President Ma Ying-jeou in Taipei has, has open political discussion with the leaders in Beijing. So I think both sides uh, do not want to see a return to confrontation. They want to find some way to uh, get along, even though Taiwan clearly wants to manage its own affairs. And the mainland China uh, does not want a big uh, confrontation uh, today over, over Taiwan. Whether democratization of uh, mainland China politics would be the basis for some understanding or whether just shared economic interest and a desire to have stability in the region so that each, each uh, side of the strait manages its own affairs, whether that could be the basis for some symbolic form of, uh, of reunification is, is an open question. And uh, I would not expect that issue to uh, come about uh, very quickly, uh, but we see a positive relationship across the Taiwan Strait, and that is certainly something that uh, we encourage so that it gives the people on Taiwan uh, the opportunity to run their own affairs, to develop their own economy uh, without a sense of military threat from the mainland. Any other questions?
Hi, thank you very much for coming here and putting this on and uh, allowing us to ask a few questions. Um, sure. Uh, I've spent the, the better part of uh, the last decade living overseas in China. I remember when I first moved there in uh, 2000, some of my local friends, they were very passionate about joining the Communist Party and especially getting into the party at a relatively young age. After going back to China over the last couple of years, I've kind of seen this, this lack of interest from my friends who are getting into the party, now do it more as a political movement to either get government contracts for work or just do it because that seems to be the, the thing to do to move ahead in business. Do you, have you seen that kind of experience in your travels and, and work with China? And do you see that as a sort of, I don't want to say dismantling, but a weakening of the Communist Party? This is one of the changes that in, uh, in uh, politics and uh, society in China today, uh, what we're seeing is a growing gap between uh, the leadership and the society. It used to be that uh, if you wanted to get ahead and have a good life, that joining the Communist Party was the, the best way to get ahead. But with the development of the economy, many people are finding that, well, politics is too complicated, or I can uh, do very well professionally and in improving my standard of living by focusing on the economic side of things outside of the party. And uh, so that there's this growing gap between the society, which has been mobilized and has taken off because of China's economic growth, and the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. And I mentioned earlier that uh, China is a wired society. The information revolution is transforming the population. They know what's going on, they communicate with each other, and they express their unhappiness with aspects of, of life and with party leadership. They don't like the corruption, they don't like the, the disparity between the uh, the well, well-to-do and ordinary people. So this is one of the big issues that the new leadership that will come to power in China in the spring of uh, next year is going to have to deal with. We know they're concerned about uh, this, this gap between the society and the party, and there are big debates going on within the leadership about how much to kaifan to open up the political system as opposed to maintaining le the leadership of, of a one-party system. So you've, you've identified a critical issue, and next year is going to be very interesting to see how the new leadership uh, deals with this very fundamental issue for the future of, of the country and certainly the future leadership position of the Communist Party. Uh, just a point of personal uh, privilege. I was in your class in, in 1971 during that big year. Uh, I don't, you probably don't remember me, uh, Bob. I, I wrote about uh, whether China would accept membership in the UN, maybe, and Professor Whiting and you co-advised me on this. This question has nothing to do with, with that. I wonder if you think the Bo Xilai uh, situation is significant. Will anything come of that? And then there have been uh, more than one. Uh, there was another. The, the reason the Boise Lies scandal was so profound is for several reasons. One is I think it exposed, exposed a split or factions within the leadership. And uh, the party is, is struggling to create a balance of, if you like, factional interests in this new leadership. But in some ways, the more profound impact of the Boise Lai scandal is what the, the public learned about his son. And the special privileges that the so-called princelings and their children have gained, not just studying abroad at first-class foreign universities, but the high life they lead, 
ball guagua, driving a Porsche, uh, having a party atmosphere in other countries. These, these images and this information gets back to the population. They learn about it on their versions of Facebook or on the internet. And so that further widens the gap between the society and the party and the level of distrust between the population and the Communist Party leadership. So in that sense, the Bossy Lai scandal, which is only one and perhaps a more high profile example of the corruption or the loss of, uh, which we say, revolutionary discipline uh, within the party is going to cause the new leadership tremendous problems. And how they deal with it will remain to be seen. They're clearly punishing uh, Bossy Lai and his wife to make them uh, negative examples. Uh, but there are many other instances of this kind of uh, corruption or bad behavior that uh, are further reinforcing the alienation of the population from the party. Thank you. Good morning to those of you in Beijing. Good evening to those in the eastern, central, and mountain states. Good afternoon to those in the west coast in Hawaii. I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I am pleased to welcome audiences from 60 venues throughout the country to our sixth annual China Town Hall Local Connections, National Reflections. I know as we speak that Hurricane Sandy is pounding the United States Northeast and our home in New York. Our thoughts are with you. Stay warm, stay dry, stay safe. We created China Town Hall in the belief that the U.S.-China relationship is the defining relationship of the 21st century and that getting that relationship right is the key to peace and stability throughout the world. This, this year's Chinatown Hall falls at a particularly crucial time, eight days before our elections and 10 days before the 18th Party Congress when, President, when Vice President Xi Jinping, who we hosted as part of his trip this past February, will ascend to the presidency of China. The discussion of the U.S.-China relationship during this campaign for president has been disappointing. It's lack depth and nuance, which is one of the many reasons we're holding this China Town Hall this year. We are fortunate to have with us an extraordinary American, Gary Locke, a man of many firsts, the first Chinese-American ambassador to China the first Chinese-American Secretary of Commerce, the first Chinese-American governor of the state of Washington. America could not have found someone better prepared to be ambassador to China. The fact that we, he is one of the first Americans who served in the United States cabinet to be amba an ambassador is a symbol of how important President Obama finds the U.S.-China relationship. I want to thank our partners at all of our venues and our small but very dedicated National Committee staff, which has done a magnificent job in coordinating this complex, especially today, global project. Let me also thank our speakers, none of whom are paid. It's a veritable who's who of China experts in America. They've traveled throughout the country to talk with you because they believe, as we do, that educating Americans about China will help fashion policies that are in the best long-term interests of the United States. In addition, let me thank the Starr Foundation for providing funding for this exciting program. Last, but certainly not least, let me thank Ambassador Locke for joining us today. We are accepting questions right now, submitted electronically from all of our venues. We'll get to as many as we can 
but let me apologize in advance to those that we cannot get to. Let me now turn the floor over to Ambassador Locke. Thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thanks so much, uh, Steve, for hosting this and to the uh, National Committee, a group that's been so central to U.S.-China relationships going back uh, to the 1960s. Uh, thank you so much for all your great work. Uh, the committee has really contributed so much to U.S.-China relations over the years, and special thanks to all the supporters and funders uh, of this uh, great uh, National Committee. First of all, as Steve mentioned, we want to mention uh, Hurricane Sandy on the American East Coast. We're watching the news of the winds, the flooding, and the power outages, and our hearts go out to everyone affected. Uh, we're keeping you in our thoughts and our prayers. Please stay inside. Uh, be safe. I'm really pleased to be here today uh, knowing that uh, we're connected with so many different locations throughout the United States. Uh, I looked at the list of participants and there, as Steve indicated, some truly outstanding China hands. And I'm honored to have a chance to communicate with all of you. When President Obama asked me to represent the United States here in China, I was very humbled and honored. Uh, to have the chance to serve as ambassador, uh, representing the land that I was born in and the land I love, America, uh, and to be here in the land of my ancestors, China, is something of great pride to me. It's been particularly gratifying to serve at the 40-year mark of modern U.S.-China relations with so many challenges and opportunities before us. So I'd like to share a few perspectives with you before we start uh, getting to your questions. As the two largest economies in the world and the two largest populations in the Asia-Pacific, the United States and China have a unique role to play in ensuring regional peace and prosperity. We have a shared interest in working together not just for the good of our own people, but really the people of the entire Asia-Pacific region and indeed all the people of the world. As our leaders have said, we intend to make history with our relationship uh, with China in the 21st century. We intend to find a way to coexist and cooperate without unhealthy competition, rivalry, or conflict. As President Hu Jintao, Vice President Xi Jinping, and Secretary Clinton have all argued, conflict between a rising power and an established power is not inevitable. We simply must forge a relationship based on mutual respect and mutual benefit. In our economic relationship, we believe this requires fairness uh, in both policy and practice. Fairness means guaranteeing a level playing field for healthy competition between U.S. and Chinese firms, establishing a more open investment climate and ensuring more opportunities for foreign goods, products, and services, ending distorting currency practices, and improving protections of intellectual property that allow innovation to thrive. We also need to demonstrate real results in confronting the international challenges that threaten the prosperity and security of our two countries all around the globe. The world is looking for leadership from the United States and China. And it's my hope that 50 years from now, the history books will say, will talk about the great accomplishments that we together made and not that we failed to act. China and the United States do not always agree. And there are some issues on which we hold very differing views, such as human rights and basic freedoms. The promotion of universal human rights is an essential element of American foreign policy. It reflects who we are as a people and our belief that respecting these rights is in every country's national self-interest. As President Obama and Secretary Clinton have so eloquently stated, Reforms that support universal human rights give people a greater stake in the success of their own nation, which in turn makes society more stable, prosperous, and peaceful. It's our conviction that a China that is more open to all views, ideas, and expressions will lead to a stronger and more secure China, which is something that the United States and the world welcome. Let me be clear. We welcome a prosperous China that takes its rightful place on the world stage. And we want to partner more fully with China to promote peace, stability, and development, which benefits our two countries, the Asia-Pacific region, and indeed the entire world. The good news is that today, the United States and China are working together more than ever in ways large and small to expand our cooperation and, and to address the global challenges that we face. On the economic front, we're working together to achieve real results for both of our peoples. 
40 years ago, it would have been difficult to imagine the interdependence that characterizes our two nations today. To put this in tangible terms, in 1972, when President Nixon first came to China, our yearly two-way trade was less than $100 million. Investment in each other's markets were close to zero, and only a handful of American jobs relied on trade with China. Now, today, more than a billion dollars of goods and services flow between our two countries every single day, and over 700,000 American jobs depend on producing made-in-America goods and services or food grown in America, all of which is then sold to China. An even larger number of Chinese jobs are anchored by trade with the United States. So people in both countries are benefiting from this deepening economic integration. But there are real challenges to doing business with China. And so all of us across the federal agencies are focused on leveling the playing field for American firms doing business here in China. And we're using the full range of tools that are available to us to ensure that China lives up to its commitments to the, under the WTO and with its trade agreements. In the last four years, we've brought more WTO cases against China than the previous administration in eight years. And in each of the cases that have been completed, we've either received a very strong favorable ruling from the WTO or settled the case on very favorable terms. In addition, we've successfully used trade negotiations such as the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade and the annual U.S.-China Strategic Economic Dialogue to achieve improvements in China's intellectual property rights enforcement, to further open China to uh, uh, the automobile insurance market for American companies, and to improve market access generally without technology transfer preconditions. And China has agreed to reduce its tariffs and taxes on imported goods which will expand Chinese domestic consumption, but also demand for made in USA goods and products. We are constantly pressing China to do even more. Turning back to the States, Chinese companies with operations in America are also making important contributions to US output and employment. Chinese direct investment in the United States increased almost eightfold between 2005 and 2011 from $700 million to almost $5.4 billion. And it's on a record pace so far in 2012, uh, with some almost $4 billion completed in just the first six months alone. This trend is a very positive development for both China and the United States. Because Chinese companies benefit from gaining access to the world's largest market, to a well-educated labor force, and to the most modern management and corporate governance. Our message to our Chinese friends is very clear. We welcome Chinese investment in the United States the same way that companies from other countries have invested in America, now manufacturing cars, steels, and other product, and employing thousands and thousands of American workers. We recognize that foreign investment, including Chinese investment, is vital to our economic growth, job creation, and productivity. We're also co-op we're also cooperating by expanding our people-to-people -people exchanges, recognizing that the most important part of any relationship is the last three feet. And travel between our countries fosters improved understanding between our two peoples and facilitates cooperation and collaboration in every field. Student exchanges are particularly powerful in fostering the lasting personal relationships that are so essential to U.S. cooperation with China over the long term. Right now, there are some 160,000 Chinese students studying in America right now. But we only have about 15 to 16,000 American students studying in China right now. And that's the reason for President Obama's 100,000 Strong Initiative, which seeks to have 100,000 American students studying in China over the next several years. We're working hand in hand with key private sector partners to make this objective a reality. And we hope that many American companies and other organizations that are participating tonight or to this afternoon, wherever you are, will support this endeavor with private sector funding. The United States are also working together in many ways that you may not know about. For example, the U.S. Center for Disease Control collaborated with uh, researchers in China to carry out research that resulted in new food fortification requirements, which have actually dramatically cut the rates of spina bifida in America and other birth disorders. 
The U.S.-China Aviation Cooperation Program has promoted safer aviation programs in China. And under this program, a Boeing and PetroChina joined together uh, to test flight a Chinese airline using biofuels for the very first time in late 2011. And our navies, our navies are cooperating internationally, sharply reducing the rates of piracy off the Horn of Africa, keeping some of the world's most important shipping lanes safe. In the past two years, we've had some over 20 U.S. governors visiting China, several of whom have announced plans to open up new state offices in China to encourage more American exports to China, investment, educational, and cultural linkages. All of these joint efforts that I've talked about show that the United States and China can work together in the Asia Pacific and indeed around the world to support common goals and, a, and achieve real results. We still have a long ways to go, but I'm hopeful that working together we can escape from the historical patterns and instead forge a legacy of cooperation and partnership that will be a model for future generations. Just as the opportunities we face are global in scope, so are the challenges. From climate change to poverty, from nuclear proliferation to, dis to diseases, no country can solve these problems alone. Our countries may have different cultures, languages, and histories, but our peoples have the same shared goals, a better life for themselves, their children, and their children's children. In conclusion, let's just imagine what we can accomplish 50 to 100 years from now if our peoples, our businesses, and our governments are working more closely together. Now we look forward to your questions. Ambassador Locke, thank you so much. That actually, I think, is a fair representation of the nuanced discussion of the U.S.-China relationship that I would have liked to see in the campaign. So my first question, actually, is one which is also given by someone from uh, your home state. Uh, he's, it's um, David in Pullman, Washington, who actually asks about the campaign rhetoric which has been rather harsh about China in the United States. And he says, how do you engage China's leadership when the rhetoric about China assumes center stage and seems to be uh, out of sync with the real U.S.-China relationship? So, and my question was going to be, does this rhetoric affect how you deal with the Chinese leadership? Well, you know, actually, we're not, uh, since we're here in China, we're nonpartisan and we don't focus on the campaign. Uh, but we all, as individuals and Americans, have a great interest uh, in what's happening. Uh, but we're focused on the relationship here with China, and we're really on the ground trying to advocate on behalf of American companies, American interests, and American values. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the U.S.-China relationship, especially on the economic front, is growing. It's robust, but it's also very challenging. Uh, as I indicated, some over 700,000 American jobs depend on U.S. exports to China. And our exports have been growing uh, exponentially. Um, you know, actually, if you look at uh, where we were in the year 2000, exports to China are six times greater today than they were in the year 2000. Imports from China uh, are four times greater today than they were in 2000. Um, and so many jobs depend on, on that trade. In agriculture, uh, China is actually our farming community's number one export destination. It always goes back and forth between Canada and China. But this last year alone so far, exports of our agricultural goods have grown by almost 30 percent, 27 percent in fact. And so China right now is our number one agricultural export destination and supports so many hundreds of thousands of farm related jobs. So it's a challenging relationship. We want that uh, the quantity of trade to grow, but we also want more access, a level playing field for American firms, um, protection for intellectual property. So we are focused every single day on, f on uh, these fundamental everyday issues on behalf of American people uh, and American companies. Because when I was Commerce Secretary, we had this model. Uh, the more that we can export American-made goods and services to China, the more American companies produce. And the more they produce, the more workers they need, and that means jobs which we really need in America, and that's why we focused uh, uh, on these initiatives. Last night, there was an extraordinary performance at the National Theater right off of Tiananmen here in Beijing of the U.S. Army Band and the PLA Band 
where they, I, at the end, they, they jointly perform Stars and Stripes to a, quite a rousing ovation from a mostly uh, PLA and American audience. It was quite something. And it, I sat there and watched and thought, are there areas, and this was, again, obviously symbolic, but are there areas where we could partner better with the Chinese? When you think about it, if you had your wish, wish list of what we could do better with the Chinese, what would it be? Well, actually, as I indicated in my opening remarks, there is a lot of great cooperation between the United States and China on so many fronts, large and small. For instance, our militaries, as I indicated, are cooperating uh, and trying to fight the, the rates of piracy, the incidents of piracy off the coast of Africa. Uh, we're working very, uh, we work hand in hand uh, with China on trying to stop the conflict in Sudan uh, and between Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, our, our scientists are cooperating uh, extensively on trying to find alternative energy uh, and um, uh, addressing um, also uh, trying to uh, cure some of the most dreaded diseases of the world. Uh, I really think that uh, uh, the key to greater cooperation really lies in more people-to-people -people exchange. As I indicated, we have about 160,000 Chinese students studying in America every single year learning our values, uh, being introduced to American democracy and, and American way of life. But we only have about 15, 16, 17,000 American students studying in China every single year. We need more people from America to come to China to understand the history, the culture, the language, uh, and the values of China. If we are then to have a greater cooperation uh, among our companies, uh, among our scientists, our researchers, our universities, our governments, and obviously our people. This is from Jeff in Madison, Wisconsin. Please evaluate the seriousness of the argument between China and Japan regarding the, the Diao Yidao. Well, uh, there's a, a, a conflict between uh, uh, Japan and China uh, over the islands in the uh, East China Sea, and the United States does not uh, take a side on the ultimate sovereignty uh, of those islands or with any of the other uh, island disputes in the South China Sea between China, Vietnam, and China, uh, for instance, and the Philippines. But what we do uh, want is a peaceful diplomatic resolution of all these issues uh, without uh, the use of force, uh, without coercion or intimidation. Because we as a country and indeed the rest of the world have a deep interest in freedom of navigation and the free flow of commerce. And we want uh, uh, all the, uh, the parties to uh, resort to diplomacy and engagement uh, so that uh, uh, conflict does not arise within the region that, that could affect the entire world and certainly without disruption to uh, commerce that is so vital uh, to the economies and the livelihood of people all around the world. From Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, lie, L-A-I. <laughs> what was the biggest surprise for you when you became U.S. ambassador to China? Well, I, I guess one of the biggest surprises was the fact that people knew so much about me and recognized me even when we went on to the Great Wall within the first couple of weeks and some of the vendors all recognized us and <laughs> wanted our pictures taken, uh, pictures taken with us. Uh, uh, there's a picture of, of me buying a, a cup of Starbucks and, and some drinks for the family at the SeaTac International Airport as we were getting ready to, uh, as we were departing uh, America for China that went viral. And I had a backpack on my back, and uh, uh, and and because of that, I, I don't know who took the picture, but it, it went viral, and and as a result, some of the Chinese media were camped out at the airport when we arrived and saw us carrying our luggage and cats and dogs and and uh, and uh, backpacks and uh, with uh, the kids' uh, toys and crayons and and uh, electronic games and things like that. So that made quite a stir, and that was completely uh, unexpected completely unexpected. But the Chinese people have been so great and so welcoming and engaging, and, and um, uh, we feel very, very blessed and honored to be here. Someone from New York who is um, braving the storm, uh, Denzi, uh, please share what you learned during your recent visit to the Tibetan Aba Prefecture. What is the U.S. role in resolving the, what he calls, deteriorating human rights situation in Tibet and Xinjiang? Well, uh, I happened to be in Sichuan province uh, in late uh, September uh, in Chengdu, uh, Chongqing, uh, advocating on behalf of U.S. companies uh, for increased trade, meeting with government officials. And I use that opportunity to also go to uh, Aba Prefecture, which is part of Sichuan province, uh, to visit with uh, some of the uh, 
the people there, uh, Tibetan people who were involved in the uh, tourism industry, but also to visit some of the uh, Tibetan monasteries and uh, uh, to under, really get an appreciation of the Tibetan culture and the way of life uh, in uh, that predominantly Tibetan area. Um, we have very serious concerns about the, the violence, uh, the self-immolations uh, that have occurred uh, over the last uh, several years, very deplorable. Uh, uh, nobody wants that type of, of, uh, of action or people having to resort that type of action. Uh, too many deaths, too many deaths. Um, and uh, we implore the Chinese to really uh, meet with the representatives of the Tibetan people uh, to address uh, and re-examine some of the policies that have led to some of the uh, restrictions and the violence uh, and the self-immolations. And uh, uh, we're very concerned about the human rights condition here in China. Um, but uh, we very much believe that uh, the Chinese government needs to meet with Tibetan leaders uh, to uh, examine the policies that are giving rise to the violence uh, and uh, in Tibetan areas. Uh, we very much believe that uh, there should be a respect for the culture and the religion of the Tibetan people, as well as the language of the Tibetan people. Lynn in Sarasota, Florida. As Chinese currency valuation changes, what effect has it had on the U.S. economy? And I guess I would add to that if, um, of course, you're representing President Obama, but if Governor Romney is elected and he brands China a currency manipulator on day one of the next administration, what do you think the effect on the U.S.-China relationship would be? Well, I can't speculate on what the Chinese leaders will do and, and what, uh, what will happen then. I can only tell you that uh, uh, the Chinese currency has appreciated by uh, roughly 10 percent when you also factor in inflation. And it's... Uh, 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 appreciated substantially over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, that, of course, makes uh, Chinese goods more expensive in the United States, but also American uh, products and goods and services cheaper in America. Uh, as I in indicated, uh, uh, our, our trade is growing. Uh, the ex U.S. exports of goods and services and agriculture is some six times higher today than it was in the year 2000. Uh, and certainly since the, uh, China uh, joined the WTO and has had to open up its markets uh, to uh, American products and services. But what we really need to focus on, and, and the big concern of American companies, is the lack of a level playing field. Uh, some of the discriminatory policies that the Chinese government impose against foreign firms, and, and including American firms, where certain sec in certain sectors American firms cannot even do business, uh, uh, or uh, the Chinese government has a very uh, uh, has subsidies that favor the Chinese companies, or there's a not strong enough enforcement of intellectual property rights, uh, and so forth. So that's what we're really focused on, and I think that's the number one priority of uh, U.S. companies uh, wanting to do business here in China or already doing business here in China. Another from your home state, but this one from Seattle. The first one was from Pullman. Um, you've been working hard to attract Chinese companies to invest in the United States. They make contributions to U.S. employment, as you just said. But in two recent cases, clean energy, which was I guess, I'm referring to the wind power case, and IT, I assume referring to the Huawei ZTE fi uh, uh, finding by the House Intelligence Committee, Chinese companies have been blocked from doing so. How can you promote U.S. as an investment destination with these kinds of um, activities in the United States, and this is from Christie mm -hmm. in Seattle. Well, actually, if you look at uh, uh, the investment climate in America for foreign firms, it is still the most open investment uh, destination uh, and the most desired uh, investment destination around the world. Uh, roughly for the last several years,